and we are live, but nobody can see us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Three, two, one. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Gerald. I'm Maya. And I'm Anais. And on, before we get started, I want to let everyone know that I don't foresee this particular episode getting saucy, but sometimes we do. So if we slip into any kind of potty mouth, we will make sure to put that in the show notes and as the iTunes rating for this episode. Share it with caution with your children. If you haven't read The Empty Family by Colm Toybin and don't want to be spoiled, pause the podcast, read the story, then come back. This is a story told in the first person, in a style which is indicative of a letter to a third person, a former lover. The narrator is returning to Ireland from an extended stay in the USA. He is returning to a house he inherited and which he has been keeping ready for his return and to which he's been sending back pieces of art and photographs. He recounts a meeting with his ex-partner's sister-in-law and then another meeting with the brother where he's shown a telescope and how to use it. He recounts trips he made to the, in the USA to the beach where memories of this house were brought to life. On his return, he is unsure whether he is going to stay, whether he wants to turn back the clock and settle back down. His use of a single wave as seen through the telescope as a metaphor for his own life, a struggle against everything around it, but with inner strength and beauty, is the key to the story. Okay, so... Before we dive in, first, I want to say something to everybody. Do you know what today is? Do you know? No. It's our anniversary. It's our six-month anniversary. This is our 26th episode. So, How romantic. round of applause, everybody. Woo! So, now that I've gotten that out of the way. I should pop some champagne. But I'm, too, I'm poor people, so I don't have champagne. So, I'll pop some Diet 7 up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you hear it? There you go. There's our champagne. Um, Before. How did everybody feel about the story, just top level? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Did you have any initial thoughts? I can go first. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't really my style. It's already in my voice. You guys are ready. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of one of those stories where it's like, I didn't really like it, but I don't have strong feelings as to why I didn't like it. There's nothing I can really point to where I'm like, that's what did it in. I just, at the end of it, kind of just, okay, that's it. Just didn't care. How about you, Gerald? I loved it. You loved it. Oh, that's I good. I loved it. You would. So I guess this <laughs> I get to be Annie's because I'm torn. I guess I'm in between you guys. Um, I wanted to like it because the language was so freaking beautiful. And there were so many moments that were just right on. And... You know, I've talked to people from that area who come here, and there's just so many, you know, his idea of going to Point Reyes to feel that memory of back home just feels like it's like these beautiful little details of truth. But there was something about it that wouldn't let me completely dive in. And towards the end, I, like at first I was going to rate it one thing, like I was liking it at a certain level, and then something happened toward the end that just dropped it like a stone for me. So I think this is going to be an interesting conversation. So where do we want to start? Should, should I start where about... Yeah. Why don't we talk about what we liked about it? What we liked. Uh, what we loved about it. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, love. <laughs> I, I love. I love. I, I love. <laughs> no, can we move on? Um, I I love the language. I loved the way in which it's a very simple story. A very, um, it's it's a simple idea. You know, one man coming back home um, from the USA. But there's so many different parts to it. So many different threads to it. Um, and the the sort of the links between his his time in America and Ireland were sort of always there. So this this place is always in the back of his mind, um, and it's almost like he he's drawn back here. He had no choice. He he had to come back because it's where where he belongs. And um, so that's so I that's what I loved about it. It's Apart from the language, he's well known for his 
his beautiful use of language um, and and I think the story worked as a you know it, there was no resolution but I don't think it needed one I think it was um, it was a story that had a, a, a start and an end and, and a, a very very lovely middle sorry <laughs> no I liked it and it it I'm waiting for Annie's jump right yeah. in girl yeah well, okay, so we're talking about what we like about it. I liked mm -hmm. um, sort of the themes that it was exploring. It was looking a little bit into the definition of what home is because he, he keeps coming back to this place, but he mentions other places in Ireland as well. And um, kind of like those final days and, and how you've come to be here. And uh, not final days, I mean, he's not on death's door, but, you know, you, you get a sense, like he says he doesn't need to work again. He's kind of like he's retired. You get a sense he's an older person. And um, and it's kind of like that loneliness towards the end, how that's impacting him, if he has any regrets, which I think he does because he's writing to his ex-lover who he left. He admits to leaving her. Um, and there's or a little bit... Him. Or him. Yeah, him or her. And there's a little bit of... Um, uh, he, it doesn't come right out and say it, so I might be just sort of projecting because there aren't that many clues, but there's a little bit of like what's home without family going on. Not necessarily mm -hmm. family like kids and the whole nine yards, but just at least one other person that you love, something that takes it from a house to a home. So those themes are timeless. I like that. I like the older perspective. Um, but yeah, I guess we can get into what we don't like a little bit later. But hey, I, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm just. I guess what I'm saying is, despite liking all of that, it still didn't make me love the story. Yeah, which is fine. You know, right now we just really want to talk about you know the parts that we did like because I have a feeling the parts that we didn't like is going to get really into the weeds and maybe a little deep. Um, as far as what I liked, I liked the language. I liked pretty much everything you both liked. I loved um, the sense of isolation, loneliness, and despair. I felt like those were really well captured and the sense of not feeling completely at home when you're home, you know, and the need to escape it, but you can't completely escape it. There was something about the way it was captured that was just gorgeous to me. And that's what I mean when I say I felt like I, I wanted to like it. Like, I really wanted to like it. I am predisposed to liking a story like this. It's got pretty language, and it's got miserable people. Like, it's my kind of story. Bring it. And yet... <laughs> It didn't completely follow through for me, but the language was amazing, and it, you know, at some points it was almost like prose poetry, at other points it was maybe like an excerpt of a novel. Um, the language was so impactful, especially in the first half, that um, I would recommend it to anybody to read, even though, you know, when we can talk about this in a minute, um, it had some serious problems for me. Uh, Gerald, was there anything in particular that you didn't like about this story or were you just rah-rah? Um, rah-rah. Yeah, we need to give you pom-poms. <laughs> we all need pom-poms for when we're like rah-rah about a story. <laughs> I, I think it's it's not... It's, it's, I suppose when, when we come to marking, I, I, I won't give it a, a six because there's because it, it's it's a story within itself so there's no um themes that sort of transferred to life or there's no you know long lasting um something about about me or life or or, or anything it didn't else. stick to your ribs um, it didn't stick to <laughs> <laughs> can, can we, can we, that needs to be a phrase because <laughs> It, it actually is a phrase. I think it's probably an Americanism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yeah. In 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 that, it, it, uh, the, the simplicity of, of the story um, means that that the that the themes, the underlying themes, aren't transferred. I don't I don't think it's the the despair. I think it's. It's sort of naturally miserable is 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 how it, it sort of comes across to me. But he he mm -hmm. doesn't. I think I think he's quite content. He's 
I don't. I don't think he's older. He's he's re- been able to retire because he inherited the, his parents the two died other and he houses. Sold the houses. Yeah, and yeah. sold the houses at the top of the market. So so, but he's probably the fact that he's he ship that broke down, and and he's been in America for a, a number of years. So he's he's probably. I would guess he's, you know, late thirties, forties. Yeah, I was guessing around forties, especially because he had evidently had something with um, his ex's sister-in-law, and he had last seen the kid when he was small, and then he was saying the kid was big. So I'm guessing like probably early forties. Um, hmm. How about you, Annie? What, what? What? I'm gonna. Okay, I'm gonna wind her up and set her off, Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> No, can, can I, I turn I was, my volume down? Yeah. Well, I was I was being honest, and I was saying there isn't any particular thing where like I'm like, why did you do this? Like, there's nothing that I'm too sort of like strongly opinionated about in terms of the negatives. But there was something you said, Maya, where you said you liked the language in the first half slightly better. I preferred the language in the second half. And as I was reading the sur- the first half, it reminded me of in the last episode when I said that there's that tone which is like, feel with me. This is what I'm talking about. That like <laughs> voice that's like, it, which which isn't something that I necessarily hate, but I don't love it. So, I mean, I also can't hate it because it's so popular that if I hated it, I'd just be like an angry reader because it's used a lot and it makes sense that it's used a lot because a lot of times writers are writing from an emotional place that they're feeling. So, of course, it, that comes through in the voice. And I feel like the first half, that was what was carrying it, was feel with me without like – giving you any substance and I was more interested when he started giving me visuals when I started seeing scenes when I started seeing everything through his eyes instead of just sort of getting an impression of his emotional state so yeah, yeah. um I, I don't mind emotionally rot language as long as it doesn't beat me over the head like leave me some room to interpret on my own. And I think a lot of writers are so insecure about their writing that they just assume readers aren't going to quote unquote get it. And so they just hit too hard with it. And I felt like in the first half of the story, he did a, he did a good job of not beating me over the head with it. Um, it's weird. The point of view. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. It's first person point of view. Most the reason why most young adult novels, a lot of children's novels are written in first person is because it brings you in closer to the to the narrator. So typically when you're reading a first person story, you're 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 closer to the narrator, you're easier to feel the feelings, you're seeing it through the character's eyes. Why did I feel so distant throughout this story? This story felt really distant to me. Even though it was first person, I could not get close to the narrator at all. And that's the first time that's happened for me in a first person story. And there actually was a point for me that turned it off, that turned me off entirely. Like the first half, I was like, you know, this is beautiful language. I'm loving it on a cerebral level, but I'm not feeling it. But I was okay because I was intellectually feeling it. And so I was totally into it. And then he got to the point where he was describing, he talked about, um, what does he say? He says, home was two houses, which they left me when they died, and I sold at the very height of the boon. That entire paragraph completely, I was like, okay, we could have ended the story much sooner. That's when I started noticing that as I was reading, I was looking towards the end, I was fighting to finish it, I felt like the story could have ended sooner than it did. And that was the thing that finally was like, okay, you know, as much as I am trying to like it intellectually, I can't go in whole hog because it just went on too long for me. But I thought that was weird about it being a first person story and I felt distant throughout the entire story. I think it's funny. I didn't think it was distant for me personally, but I will say that I didn't get in too close in a sense. I think it's because I didn't want to. I didn't dislike the narrator, but it's it's like not somebody I would ever befriend. There was something kind of like, there's just something about the way he kept kind of like talking about himself and his relationships where it was kind of like, I feel like he was fooling himself. Like I didn't believe 
him, like, like he was being introspective, but I felt like he was being introspective in this very sort of curated way, which people do, which isn't really a fault. People do that when they kind of look back on their life and they're like, oh, I'm looking at my history, you know, at my history. Yeah, and we're all like, reliable narrators in yeah, that but way. They're, but yeah, but they're cherry picking, and there was some, like, obvious cherry picking to me where I'm just like, okay. Like, this is a guy who's clearly hurt people, and he's not reflecting on that. He's like, when I left you, skipping over that. When you basically had an affair with Anne, like, that was, you know, with the sister-in-law, which was kind of hinted at. I'm like, mm -hmm. mm, okay. And, and, and you know what? Or... He definitely had a little rough around the edges at that moment where when he was like, um, what did he say? I kind of snickered. I was like, ouch, at one she point. That she aged and Bill was spry? No, it was, it was the, maybe, maybe the passing years have helped your sanity. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like he's writing like, letters. Ouch, that was a little painful. <laughs> <laughs> totally sounds like something my ex would say. <laughs> and it's believable. I believe people like this exist. People do this. I've seen them. I've seen people do it. I believe it, but it's just not necessarily somebody where I'm like, oh, I'm going to have you over so we can just talk for hours, you know. Yeah, well, see, I... I, I, I I don't think I have I to like I a character to get close to a character. I'm sorry, Gerald. We're, we're both trying to say something at the no, same time. <laughs> no She's going to love editing that. <laughs> you go first, and then I'll go. <laughs> okay. I'll, and then at the end, I'll say over. And you <laughs> no, it, um, yeah, this, this sort of distance thing. I, I, I know what you're both saying about that. and And I think... This is quite hard to pin down, but I I felt the same. I didn't feel that it detracted from the story or put me off, or I I certainly didn't not like the the, the character. Um, but but there's 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 almost an ethereal nature to his nar narrative. It's it it's it's I don't know, the, the, but there is something there's. Maybe because, maybe because it's couched in 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 such a such a, a, a sort of poetic language that that there's there's very few hard facts to to home in on. You you can't because it's first person. You can't you can't imagine the character. You can't know what he's like. Um, and we're presuming it, it's a he. We don't don't know if we know that, but. Um, we can so, safely assume that, given the voice. Like it's a very masculine voice. Oh, I I can't yeah. imagine like even like the hardest alpha girls I know do not have that voice. <laughs> nah. So <laughs> and I, the invitation I, to the telescope was it a tip off too? That is a guy. Yeah. Yeah, because that's eye bonding thing. thing. <laughs> <laughs> Come bond over my telescope. <laughs> I've got a telescope too. Perhaps that's perhaps that's why I like the story. Okay, next. <laughs> move on, move on. Um, um, <laughs> I get what you're saying, and you know, part of me thinks it's on purpose because there's so many references to the sea, and the sea is such like this beautiful, poetic, but yet very distant metaphor. It's a very distant thing. When you look at it, you realize how tiny you are. And I feel like some of his distance, some of his reluctance, and, and some of some of my distance as I'm reading it really is a reflection of how the character is feeling. So, but at the same time, I don't mind a story that doesn't have a quote-unquote plot. I don't mind a story that is all plot and has low character. I don't mind a story that doesn't have plot and doesn't have character if it has amazing language. But it has to have something. And the language on this was good. It was, it was beautiful, but it only carried it so far for me. And it wasn't enough to override the, my personal need to either have get closer to the character, not necessarily facts, but to feel emotionally close to the character as he's going through this journey. I kind of felt like as I was reading it, like this was a walk, like he was taking me on this on this winding walk on this journey that he's in, but I was like several, space, several paces behind instead of being right next to him. And I wanted to be next to him 
because there wasn't any plot, I wanted it. I wanted to be closer to the character so that I can feel those things that he's going through at, instead of feeling like I'm sitting back watching it from a distance. And, you know, that's probably an artistic choice because he's sitting back watching the sea from a distance. Like, I can get that metaphor on an intellectual level, but it wasn't satisfying for me. Mm. And I, I, as I hear you talking, I'm trying to, you know, figure out as well, like, what is it for me that didn't turn me on? And I think it's a little bit of that, but I think also for me, there was no real conflict except the one that he's kind of, the one that's tied to the metaphor of the wave. And there's no ugliness. So like another story we recently read on the podcast that has that voice of feel with me is in the cemetery where Al Jolson is buried. But she's using this feel with me voice as she's exploring, you know, we, 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 we debated if it's guilt, if it's shame, if it's regret, whatever it is, there's an ugliness there that she is introspectively trying to analyze and work through. And here it's like, it's like, Gaia, I know you're suffering and I'm sorry, but I don't know what it is because he doesn't seem to have regret for leaving the woman he's writing or the guy that he's writing to the partner or for the affair. And then, if anything, it's like, oh, and I made all this money, I don't have to work again. I'm like, maybe you're just yeah, a class that needs Zoloft. Like, like, there's a part of this that's like, <laughs> like, what's the problem? <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it is. I want to know what the problem is. And you is. know what? I think I know what the problem is for him, but it was so it subtle. Was that yeah. I think that it didn't come through. Because it's yeah. not a conventional story. It's not about an affair. It's not about death. It's not about overcoming anything particular. You know, when I was talking about the feeling of exile and loneliness being really strong in this story, I felt like that was the actual point of the story. He left home because he doesn't feel at home there. He goes back home. He doesn't tell anybody he's home. He knows he has to make a decision, and he hasn't decided whether he's going to stay or whether he's going to leave. He goes around the world, but he keeps sending stuff back to this house. He's not really living there. I don't think he's probably ever really lived there. I think that is probably the house that he just bought with some of the proceeds from his parents' house and lets it sit there as his little repository to send crap as he's going around the world. And... You know, when he's in his house, there's no sense that this is a place that feels lived in, that feels like a place. It feels like a repository for all these memories that he's just leaving there. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the conflict in the story was that feeling of not being at home in a home, that feeling of exile, of never having a place. Like, that's what I felt throughout the entire story. But... He skirted around the edges of everything, you know, um, and the language was so amazing, and I even felt like, like the way that the other characters were described were done really well. Like, there was so much about the story that I liked, and I think I'm just now putting a finger on what it was that finally turned me off, was every time I felt like it was getting close to that internal conflict that I knew was there, it would back away. So, and I didn't recognize this until you just said that, Annie. You know when I said that point where he's talking about the houses, that that was the thing that finally turned me off? Mm -hmm. I realized that the reason why it finally turned me off is the paragraph right before that was a very emotional paragraph where he was finally approaching some of those emotions that I had been waiting for him to just dig into. And then he pulled back. And I'm realizing that it was it was that getting close and pulling back that made it so unsatisfying. I wanted him to jump in, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Like the paragraph right before, the part that I, it's actually one of the paragraphs I love most. Um, the second half of it says, "I dreamed that I would leave a stone on each of their graves, as Jewish people do, as Catholics leave flowers." I smiled at the thought of the of. I smiled at the thought that in some few that in some future that in the future why well, I can't read today that in the future some archaeologists would come to those graves and study the bones and the earth around them and write a paper on the presence of these stray stones stones that had been washed by the waves of the Pacific and the archaeologists would speculate what madness what motives what tender needs had caused someone to haul them so far that I loved it and then he immediately goes into, home was also two houses, which they left me when they died, which I sold at the height of the boom in this small, strange 
country when when the prices rose as though they were Icarus. It's still beautiful, but it pulled me away. I got pulled away there too. And it pulled me away that I actually stopped reading. I dug through my pens and grabbed a highlighter. Like originally I didn't have any highlights. It was all done after that point. I grabbed my highlighter and highlighted it. Because that was the thing that finally turned me off. And until then, I felt like it was approaching something. And then, all of a sudden, it didn't approach. Thank you, Annie's, because it had been bugging me. I couldn't figure yeah. out what exactly it was about that paragraph. Because when I read it on its own, it sounds fine. Like, when I read that paragraph on its own, I like that paragraph. But when I read it right after the previous paragraph, it turns me off. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think you're wrong. Tell me why I'm wrong. I really want to know why I'm wrong because I want to like this freaking story. It's driving me crazy a little bit. <laughs> I, I think that that the theme to the story is coming home and 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 trying to relive um, an idea of what home is. So I don't I I think it says um dump, 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 um yeah, earlier on it says, uh, I missed home. I mi and then it said, it, it repeats it, I missed home. I went out to Point Reyes every Saturday so I could miss home. He's, he wants to come back. This, this house was his home at one point. It's, it's not, it's not um, an, an empty, you know, an empty house that he bought uh, and just left sitting there. It was a home and he left it and he wants to come home. So that's why he... He paid the, 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 the woman to look after the garden. He sent things because he knew at some point he was going to come home to this, this, this house. Um, and he, I think, I th now I don't know, when, when you said that, that you, you were sort of following his, his approach to sort of deep emotion and he pulled back, I don't know whether this is contrived by a writer or, or explained as a man, because because we all know men have problem dealing with emotions and their own emotion. And I thought at that point, yes, he was he was getting into sort of deep emotional thing, and then and then it's as though he said, oh, don't want to do that. Come back. This is a house I sold. Da 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 da. Um, so I I think. I think that was deliberate. I think that that was that was a deliberate. I think I, I can I can go halfway with you, okay? Mm. For me, for me, I think when he's saying he's misses home, when he talks about home, I don't think he's talking about that house. I think he's talking about the place. I feel like the place is home. This house is something that he got in order to have a root. Because he no longer has a root. His parents are dead. He sold their houses. This is the only root he's got. But he's not entirely comfortable at home. And you can't convince me otherwise. <laughs> I got but else. what I will yeah. say is, mm -hmm. I get what you're saying. I've dated older men. There is a difference. Your millennial guys are, are weird. They're like really emotional. But yeah. the older ones, they're, they're, they're not so much. And I got that. But I do not give that a pass because I feel like as a writer, you you can't pull back. You Like that's part of what it is, is experiencing those things and talking about those things that maybe you wouldn't talk about everyday life. Like, if, if you're going to tell a story that's just, you know, comfortable and what you, any person would be willing to expose, then, then where's the drama, where's the learning, where's the depth? I feel like, as a writer, part of what you're doing is you're digging into all that stuff. And so I don't know. I don't know. If it was contrived, it could have been contrived in a way that still kept me close. Like Raymond Carver does it all the time. His books are full of distant, messed up men. But I can get really close to them. He brings you in close and you're following them as they're getting close and backing away and getting close and backing away. And instead of getting close and feeling like the writer's backing away, which is what I felt. I felt like the story, I didn't feel like the character was backing away. I felt like the writer was backing away. Now I I think I think that the the writer the the character in a way I think that's that where we sort of fun because I think I think he wrote that deliberately 
and he showed that he's he has trouble with emotions he has trouble expressing them and he gets near to them and then pulls back because that's what that's what a lot of people do so he's he's in for me bringing that character to life and making it more realistic um on the object of, of the, the the actual property the the story starts with i have come back here and then the next paragraph starts with i have come back here so mm-hmm. so it's it is the home and i think the the idea because it's called the empty family so i think it's it's all it could almost be called the empty house but that would be too that would be too obvious and so he, what he's saying is that he he has he has these memories of this life he used to have in this house and with family and and relationships with other people um and he doesn't have them anymore so he's he's that's the emptiness um and he's trying to relive that by coming back to this house into the situation uh, and everything's changed even point to them the 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 brother brother and sister-in-law's child boy who has now grown up so you you there's there's that's just sort of dropped in to show a period of years have cha- have have occurred so i i think that's just one of those little things that that's been put in to show you can't come back same place and have the same life because yeah thing yeah i totally agree with that well and i think that's a part of it and i would add on to it that there seems to be this sort of thing about um like kind of like the the ennui of aging there's like this like kind of like middle age kind of like funk going on that seems to also come from a disappointment in coming home finding it empty with no family because he keeps amassing all this stuff there right Mm -hmm. he knew he was going to come back it's almost like he was nesting for like the golden years like after retirement when he doesn't have to work anymore like he's like building this like perfect little home and then he gets there and like how disappointing because when he was picturing his future it included other people and here he is alone in a house with all this stuff and there's that other hint about aging which is when um he goes to Bill and Ann's house and they're they're fussing around with the telescope and he says, I hate being shown how to do things, you know that, wiring a plug or starting a rented car or understanding a new mobile phone, add years to me, brings out frustration and an almost frantic urge to get away and curl up on my own. So there's also this kind of just like... I love that, mm-hmm. that whole paragraph, by the way. That paragraph made me smile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that, that again is an, another male thing that that we generally do hate being shown things. Oh, that's I what, hate it too. That's, yeah. that's and what it adds, and he, but that line adds years to me. It's like its own little clause. It's like, it's like one, I'm a dude. I should know how to wire a plug. And there's just this idea of like, I don't want to be an old dude, you know? But like, this is this is what he's marching towards and it's not as Oh, funny. Age. Yeah, see, when, when I read that, I didn't even think about that type of aging. I was thinking about it as a metaphor for, you know, it just... When someone is trying to explain to me something that I know how to do and I'm trying to keep my mouth shut to be polite, it really feels like it never ends. <laughs> 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 that five minute instruction feels like 20 years. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't know. Where do we go from here? Do you want to talk about the ocean? Hmm. Not really, but you guys can. <laughs> no, I feel like not really. <laughs> no, you know what? There was something about that metaphor where I'm like, I see why intellectually it works, but it just when you have it in this like come feel with me voice, but you're not telling me what your problem is. It's almost like this like a self-aggrandizing thing. Like you're comparing yourself to the ocean, but you're not really proving it by giving me what your struggle is. And maybe maybe it is just this. You know, some people get depressed without having a struggle. That's kind of the way depression works. Maybe he's in a funk. So maybe that that's the point of it. Maybe that's something. You know what? He needs a sports car and a 20 year old girlfriend, and everything will be fine. <laughs> Don't say that too loud, Gerald. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What I did like about it, um, I liked how specific it was. It was very specific. 
um, the ocean where I'm at is very different from other you know, most other places and seeing it contrasted to the ocean in Ireland the ways that it was described was beautiful um, you know and his idea of going out there and staring at it to kind of reconnect with home but feeling like it's a less domesticated ocean it's an ocean that's violent in in ways um, was 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 beautiful to me. Like that is part that is part of it that I liked. I guess I would say I like the metaphor of the ocean in the first half of the story. Um, the end of the story, I felt like it was a little bit like, okay, you can lighten up the reins. I am a reader. Like you know, you don't have to beat me over the head with it, kind of feeling. But um, I did like it. You know, uh, there were parts that I, you know, like I said, it felt. Where is it? There was one part in particular where it was just so on the nose. I was like, really, dude? You think I don't know how to read? Because you've already said this in a gazillion ways. I, I don't need it actually, like, like spelt out for me. And it was, it's all in the movement, all spillage, but it was pure containment as well. That part's beautiful. But then he goes on to say it had an elemental hold. It was something coming towards us as though to save us, but it did nothing. Instead, it withdrew its shrugging irony as if to suggest that this is what, that this is what the world is and our time in it, all lifted possibility, all complexity, and rushing fervor to the end of nothing on a small strand. I was like, the first half was gorgeous, and the second half I kind of felt like it was overkill. You know, it didn't leave me any room to come to that conclusion on my own, which I like. I like a little more space in my stories. But at the same time, I guess I'm predisposed to liking this metaphor. It it has like a real it, there's a Buddhist sense to it. There's there's something in that metaphor that's that I recognize um in my own life and in my own teachings and I find it very apt. I just felt like maybe there were a few little points where it was just a little too strongly stated. How about you, Gerald? Yeah, I, 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 I know what you mean. And, and it does sometimes feel a little bit self-indulgent, the writing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because the part that you read out particularly uh, is just does tend to go on a little bit and probably could have been cut short by... 20 or 30 words and, and, <laughs> and oh, I'm not sure um, so, um, wow Gerald Gerald said almost a snarky thing about a story he liked what? indeed yeah. Anna youth must really be rubbing nice. off yeah. <laughs> 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 and they're snark <laughs> yeah actually so, I think yeah so yeah yeah no, that, that's that's that, that's a good point. That that you know there are there are times when when he does you know why use one word when we do sort of thing. It, it's uh, it's one of those those times where someone needs to say enough. You know, full stop. Move on. <laughs> and it's funny, so I like that sometimes. Like I'm a Virginia Woolf reader. Like I have a love affair with mm. the semicolon and the never ending sentence, but. Don't tell me the same thing over and over and over within that same sentence. Like, let it be like one thought, not a repetition of the same thought. But the language is just mm. gorgeous. And at that point, it was it, it was where I was like, is this really a short story or is this poetry? There were a lot of points where I was a little confused about whether it was a short story or whether it was prose poetry masquerading as a short story. Because, you know, some writers do that because poetry doesn't sell. Um, mm. And so, you know, I, I had some of that. Is he normally a short story writer? Is he normally a novelist? I, I tried um, to do a little bit of research but I was busy. Yeah, the the, the reason I, I, I chose this story actually was because I, I was just sort of searching short, short stories and it, and it popped up. And I I think the only Booker Prize nominated novel I've ever read is, is one of his um, Blackwater Lightship which is a beautiful beautiful book wonderful book and and again it's it's like this story there there's a sort of very simple premise mm -hmm. um, underlying it but it's all, all this, this very irish beautiful language and beautiful landscape um 
that I, I you know, I, I saw, as soon as short story pop up, I thought, yes, I hadn't read it, but I just thought, I want to read it. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I think that's interesting that you said that, because as I was reading this, I, within like a couple of paragraphs, I thought, I bet I would like his novel more than I would like this short story. Like, I feel like a lot of people think short stories are a stepping stone to novels, or, or practice, you know, something you just toss off. Um, but I'm coming more and more to the conclusion that they're actually separate art forms. And this, this, even though it's short, even though there's not a lot to it, it did read like someone that is a novelist. And I think I would enjoy his novels. Like, I love the writing and the detail in it, and I can see how his novel is probably gorgeous. Like, you know, I, I, I think... I'll have to add that to my to-be-read list. I had that sense as I was reading it. I don't... I, I really, like, the more and more we read these short stories, the more and more I'm coming to the conclusion that the relationship between short stories and novels are tenuous at best. They both have words. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are quite good too. Yes, ah, yeah. good words. I love good words. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Annie? Um, well, nothing really to add to the difference between short story and novel. I agree. Um, I was just going to say, going back to the metaphor, just because you know we were talking about that. I remember. I think part of the reason why I didn't like it too much. A little bit was because when he set it up, he was like, "I realized then that the sea is not a is not a pattern; it is a struggle." And th that part made me stop because I'm like, "Who <laughs> says the sea is a pattern?" Uh, you know, like there was a part where I was like, "What? Like, <laughs> is this a Britishism? Like, do people like in the UK or in Ireland specifically run around saying, you know, oh, the sea's a pattern?" The sea doesn't look like a pattern to me, no. but maybe someone who's never seen the sea would think of it as a pattern. I mean, when I w <laughs> when I went to the East Coast, I actually had someone ask me if I surfed to school. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, I just told you, I'm from Northern California. We don't touch that water. <laughs> that water is cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But to other places, like, you know, the ocean is like one big monolithic thing. Like, I gave him a pass, but you're right. It made me stop, too. I was like, huh? It just... Well, I think the reason it made me stop, because it, it almost seemed like, like, I think at that point I noticed the author. I think that's why I stopped. I was like, this yeah. is somebody trying to, like, be like, oh, I need to have an epiphany, so I need to, like, correct a common misconception. I'm like, but that's... It was that's just not a common misconception, at least not. But maybe it's not a common misconception because we're both around the ocean. We're both from places yeah. with a lot of water. Um, maybe if you're from a place without a lot of water, I don't know. But it felt weird. It did feel weird. The sea yeah. does have a pattern. It's not a red... So, and he's talking. He's, he's talking about waves in particular. So, if you look at, I mean, I can I can walk a hundred yards from my front door and, and look out to the North Sea, and and sometimes... yeah, they come in and they go out and the circadian rhythm. But no, there, there I don't is... know. I, 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 maybe it's a British. Thing. I don't know. Maybe but, it is. But... I mean, like logistically, like intellectually, I know that there's a pattern to waves and there's a pattern to the Earth's movement and all of that. But when you look at the ocean, it looks wild. Maybe this is a Pacific versus Atlantic thing because I'm normally on the Pacific side down here. And it, it, it was when he said it's a struggle. I'm like, yeah. Like it wasn't an epiphany. I'm like, because here, people drowning or getting caught in riptides is super common. Like mm -hmm. all the Same time. Here. So I think it's just kind of like, it's a struggle. Yeah, it's feral and it's horrible. There's times where I'll, you know, go into the ocean. I'm like, nope, never mind. It's extra angry today. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of similar um, where I'm at. I'm actually in the area where he was when he was in California. And Point Reyes, you know, you go and there's a few crazy surfers out there with their wetsuits swimming. And then there's the rest of us. And we get close to the water, and then we back away. And there's signs everywhere saying, don't get in the water. Not yeah. because there's sharks, but because the water will kill you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we have entire beaches where there's no sand, where it's just rocks. And the waves come in, and they crash against the rocks. And it's very violent. Um, so, yeah, it might just be 
a location thing. Like I, I would love to go and see the ocean in Ireland. It looks so pretty in pictures. Yeah, the ocean be predictable and just kind of have gentle waves coming. Nicer. It yeah. seems nicer. <laughs> like it won't kill me so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Might let me swim for half a minute. The first time I swam in the ocean, growing up on the on the west coast, the first time I swam in the ocean was when I went to New York. Oh yeah. And it was beautiful. Yeah. The Atlantic was much nicer to swim in. <laughs> I was gonna say the Jersey Shore is much nicer, but then I'm like, actually, no. <laughs> hey, you know what? The water wasn't going to kill me. It was no, somewhat true. warm. And I didn't see any sharks, so I was all happy. <laughs> well, we've gone off into the weeds or into the algae. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we've totally gone off into the algae. Okay, let's reel us in. Oh, all these puns. Ba -doom, ba -doom. boom boom <laughs> That was painful. <laughs> so are we going to rate this thing? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we spent 40, you know, 40 minutes trying to figure out what we didn't like about it and Gerald trying to convince us that it's the most best thing since life's been. And I'm still ambivalent about it. I'm still ambivalent. Like, part of me likes it. Part of me is like, great language! Oh my goodness, so beautiful, I want to read his novel. And part of me is like, there's some, there's a fatal error in the, in the story that won't let me rate it highly. And so I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to rate it. You know, um, the number that is popping into my head, like Sesame Street, is like 3.5. Like, that's what's popping into my head. So I'm going to have to give it a 3.5. Sorry, Gerald. No, it's fine. I won't cry much. I'll go next so we end up <laughs> Not <now>. much. <laughs> He's not going to cry much. I need to give much. him a Kleenex. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like before I give my rating, I need to like stress again that I tend to do ratings from a personal reader perspective. Because if I was doing this from like a more like, is it a good story? Is it well written? Kind of like academic y kind of perspective, then it would rate much higher. Because, you know, it's, it, it, it's solid in many ways. It's definitely an author that knows what they're doing. But NAE says a reader, it just didn't suck me in. Maybe it needed a little more undertow. He could have learned from the Pacific. <laughs> Oh, these yeah. puns, the puns! <laughs> they just keep coming like the waves. Ah, it just gets, gets worse. Maybe a number. Yeah, so for me, it's a 2.5. <gasps> okay, now I don't feel so bad. Mm -hmm. that's, that's harsh. I'm going to give it an 8. I'm going to give it an 8. <laughs> I don't think our, our Bradbury's go up that uh, high. <laughs> I know, I know. Um... I, oh dear, I'm going to give it a five. I'm going to give it a five okay. because I loved. Um, it didn't have ongoing resonance for me, um, and it was a little bit wordy in places. So that's that's why I've marked it down. But um, but I enjoyed it. Enjoyed it a lot. Oh, yeah. such a confusing story. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you. It was it was good to have a story that left me torn. It. it Made me think. I appreciated that. Mm -hmm. So, what game are we playing? Or let's do last week's rating real quick. Oh, yeah, that's right. Right. So, we're recording this week's episode just two days after releasing Cathedral, the Cathedral episode. So, we only got one listener rating, and it was a six, a top score. Um, really? They gave it a six? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and it wasn't it wasn't Todd or my mom. It's a new commenter. Thank you so much, Richard. <laughs> oh yes, Richard's comment. I saw it come through my phone when I was taking my daughter to um, her orientation, her college orientation, and I was reading it, and it was such a great comment. I can't wait to get to talk to him because he seems like a great listener. Yeah, it was really. I, good. I can't wait to tell him he's wrong. <laughs> Oh. Six out of six indeed. Everyone should go to the oh. comment section for this fight. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> there's there's got to be no marriage marriage offers today, is there? Yeah. Well, but the reason why we're recording so early is because Maya is going to her first writers' conference next week. How are you feeling? Mm. Nervous. Very nervous. Um, I felt like. I chose the right conference because this conference is very craft-based, so I'm going to be learning a lot. Um, my workshop leader is a teacher who writes in a way that I really respect and that I hope to learn from. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited. 
but I'm nervous, obviously. Uh, the story that I'm workshopping is the first 30 pages of my novel, and nobody but me has seen those pages. Mm. So it's the first time those pages have been read by another par party. Mm. It's a little nerve-wracking. So, yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty stoked. <laughs> oh, I can't. We should do, like, a bonus episode where we just talk about what it was like. Oh, That's my goodness. I, I've well, been thinking well, about that, could, you know. Well, we could do a bonus episode where we where we rate Maya's story. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. Gosh, no. no. That thing. <laughs> that novel is probably going to go through six or seven rewrites before it sees us the other set of people. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Novels are hard. They're hard, you know, mm -hmm. and short stories are hard. And when you've been writing short stories and you try to write a novel and you're that detailed, it just is a little overwhelming. But mm -hmm. I'm excited. I'm going to learn a ton. I'm really lucky to be able to go. I got a scholarship to go, and it's competitive. And I just I feel so blessed to be able to go and to learn from these writers. So we'll see how it goes. I can't wait to hear you come back all excited on a high. It'll be mm. fun. Yeah, or depressed and ready to off myself and yeah. cut off my ear. <laughs> like, nobody liked my story. I'm a hack. Chop, chop, chop. <laughs> Why your ear? <laughs> Isn't that what all the best vodka. artists do? They chop off yeah. their ears right after drinking tons and tons of vodka? <laughs> uh, I guess. <laughs> okay, okay, so what game are we playing? It's time to use. Uh, it's time to choose. It's next time story. to play. Make Maya look stupid in public, right? Well, you, you're gonna like it. First, I'm sure I will. <laughs> I'm sure you won't. Uh, first, what story? <laughs> what stories? Do you... <laughs> I love you, Gerald. Um, I, I'm <laughs> submitting does. that that black box by Jennifer Egan because I really want to read that story and I want to discuss it because it seems ex it seems like an experimental story would be fun to have on here. Oh, good. Experimental. Uh -uh. <laughs> oh no. Oh come on. Um, so, You've learned uh, lots of old tricks. You can you can do an experimental story. <laughs> I think I just called you an old dog. Um, <laughs> That's okay. I've been called worse. Believe me. <laughs> and and, I... and for me, I'm actually bringing back the story that I think I submitted on our very first episode, um, The Start of the Affair by Nuruddin Farah. I know I've said it like maybe a good ten times on this podcast. I never win. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's do this. Okay. Well, so the game is, is trivia. But since we, we had... Uh, in, uh, on, on the podcast today. Um, this is this quiz is all about Ireland. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna like this. Um, <laughs> I suspect neither. Of you yeah, I, I, I know nothing about Ireland yeah, I except yeah. for you know a couple cute girls I've known, and that's it. <laughs> well, you can you can guess. Okay, well, to, <laughs> yep, I'll guess. <laughs> Maya, you're up first. Oh, of course. <laughs> Well, because it's an it it should be an easy one. Um, what lies on top of an Irish coffee? What lies on top of. On the very top. Oh yes. crap! I'm a bartender, but I haven't been at work in so long that I just. Yeah. Okay. Oh, whipped cream. Yee. Cream is the answer, so that will do. Well done. Like, I'm over here, imagine, in my brain, like, pouring yeah, bottles. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of Jamesons, a little bit of Bushmills, some coffee. Oh, yeah, and some sugar, mm. and, oh, yeah, whipped cream. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ooh, now I'm um, thirsty. <laughs> okay, Anise. In 1951, which film was shot on location in Cong, County Mayo, and directed by John Ford? Is this the one where the dead guy wins the lottery? That's the only Irish movie I've seen. <laughs> I have no idea. It's The Quiet Man. Oh, no. Never okay. even heard of it. Uh, Maya? Mm -hmm. is, the, is a bodran a drum or a fiddle? Can you say the word again? No, because it's probably pronounced wrong. B O D H R A N, Bodran or Bodran. Fiddle. Wrong. It's a drum. Ooh. I was going to say drum, but I changed my last oh. second. Dang it. Kind of trapped my intuition. 
And, and he's, I think this, this is an easy one. In 1986, which Bob received an honorary knighthood after founding Band-Aid? The founder of Band-Aid? Hmm. Is that a band or like... Like an actual band aid, like goes on your skin. You had, over, you had it over there, the concert money. Oh, band aid! I, I thought you said band aid. <laughs> like, 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 like a band aid. Like you get a cut and you put on a band aid. Yeah, that's what I thought he said. But no, band aid, A I D. Like helping yeah. other countries through bands. Yeah. Bono, sunglasses, yeah. cheesy ninety rockers. <laughs> so. Oh. So you don't, don't know. And he's, no. His first name Bob. No. See, oh, I was. That's not me. This is not very good. Can I guess? Yeah. Can I guess? Go, go on. It's probably not even. A, it's probably not even like a band, like a musician. But it's the only name that's popping in my head. Seagart. No. No, that's you, like. You're thinking of no. It's Bob Geldof. Geldof is. Geldof. Seager, is that a writer, or is that a movie star, or is that a musician? Dang it. That's going to bug me. I'm going to have to look it up. (laughs) Okay, Maya, your question. On what... (laughs) Here we go. On what day of the week was it regarded as being unlucky to cut your fingernails? I'm not going to say anything. (laughs) Monday? No. Anais? I'm just going to guess Sunday because Catholicism. Is correct. Sunday. I'm just guessing because the Catholic Church. Okay. Um, so, Anais, your question. What mm-hmm. character from radio, literary, film and comic strip has been played by an Englishman, Scotsman, an Australian and an Irishman? <gasps> oh, that's awesome! Could it be Bond? But that, no, he's not a TV guy. <laughs> Wait, it's a TV it, show, right? Oh, it's no, a TV show. No, no? radio, literary, film, oh, radio, and comic literary. Strip. Oh, okay, radio, literary, comic strip. I think I know, but I'm probably wrong. Sherlock Holmes? Nope. Nope, I have no idea. Yeah. Maya? The Great Doctor, Doctor Who. No. Am I right? No, you're wrong. Am I wrong? So I, I will give it to Annie East because she did give the answer first off, which was, was James Bond. Bond. Yeah. It was Bond? Bond was on radio? Apparently so. Wow. I, I did not that, know that Bond was on radio. I, that's why I at, backed out of Bond because I didn't know he was on yeah. radio. Yeah. I, I knew it was a book. And I didn't there, think It's Bond a whole a series Bond of books. Series. But I, I can't see it translating to radio. Interesting. Bond. Okay. James Bond. He, your question. <laughs> Who wrote Angela's Ashes? Oh, you got to be kidding me. If you would have given me the name of the author and asked what book he wrote, I could have told you Angela's Ashes. But no, you had to go the other way around. Oh. <sighs> I can see the book cover. <sighs> oh, my God. Why is his name just not sticking in my head right now. I can't, I can't remember his name. Dang it. Anise? No, me either. I can't remember. So. Oh, and it's right there, you know, when it's this just... Ooh, it's so something, bad. but I don't know the uh, end of the book. <laughs> it is, I, I, can, I can even picture him. If you ask me to draw a picture of him, I probably could. Oh, this is annoying. I love that book. Ding. The movie's great, too. Frank Mc... McCourt, thank you. That, that's I was gonna, gonna say McTavish because I'm watching. That's Cop. going to drive me crazy for the next couple days because I love that book and I love that movie and the fact that he asked me and I still couldn't remember his name makes me very sad. Mm-hmm. Never mind. It's I'm a bad. Is. I'm a bad reader. Uh, Anise, what followed Paddy Clark in the title of Roddy Doyle's Booker Prize winner? Paddy Clark, something. Eddie Clark. It's I don't Roddy, know. Roddy Doyle's. Maya, any idea? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm just going to guess Gable. <laughs> i got to guess something. <laughs> <laughs> Gable. It's hey, it, it kind of sounds nice and romantic. <laughs> <laughs> it's ha, ha, ha. 
Had his really? Mom. Ha ha ha. Yes, really. Um, okay, that's, that's a number of questions. Uh, well, I'm just glad that today's quiz made made Annie's look equally bad. Yeah, I don't know. It's me. <laughs> yeah, we need help. See, this is why I've got to travel around the world next year so I can start winning some of these dang quizzes. Yeah, I think <laughs> next year for Gerald's summer where he, you know, his like camper home vacation, we should all go to Ireland. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. We could record on location. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I'd feel worse for Gerald or his wife. <laughs> <laughs> or my dog. <laughs> yeah, you and the dog. You guys, you can go do your thing, and we'll just three of us will hang out. <laughs> hang out yeah. Uh, so at the end of of the quiz, the the questions go on for longer, but uh, I won't bother. Um, winner is an ace. <gasps> ah! Didn't I only? Okay. <laughs> I was like, which one did I get right? Bond. I know. <laughs> I thought we were equally bad. Yeah. We've got. Um, I don't know. Oh, James Bond. And you got one of my... Um... Yeah, you stole one. That's what oh, it was. Yeah. Sun Sunday. Yeah, cutting things. Yeah, because you stole Sunday. Sunday. Which, which is... <laughs> you know, and it, I guess... I, uh, you know what? I couldn't decide between oh. Friday and Sunday, and so I just chose Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Monday's that's child is full of grace. Tuesday's child is full of faith. <laughs> Wednesday's child is full of woe. Link. <laughs> oh, we can we can we can move on. So so Hi. what should we be reading next time, Anais? So next time we're reading The Start of the Affair by Nuruddin Farah. But before then, don't forget to join our discussion in the comment section at literaryroadhouse.com. That's where we call home between episodes. And please leave an iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker review. And if you enjoy our show, maybe your friends would too, so tell them. Until next time, read a good story. We did it. We've reached the halfway mark. Whoa.